I haven't eaten McDonald's since soy sauce bought it for me like two months ago. Remember that soy sauce? (laughs) I remember that. I think you bought me a Big Mac, uh, a double cheese. Yep. A double cheese. A small nugget. Yeah. I had a double cheese, and I got a small nugget too with like honey mustard and shit. Soy sauce, you know better than to feed him double cheese. It brings out the other guy that we don't like and we don't like to talk about. He ordered in the drive thru as. Well, he who must not be named. Yeah, Voldemort. <laughs> did that really happen? Did that? Did I really order? Yes, or did that you ordered. Order? You ordered for me. You ordered as the hopester. Good God! Was I was I driving your car? No. Okay, that was a different time. That was that was before because there was one time we were coming back from. <coughs> Excuse me. He's choking on popcorn over here. I'm choking on popcorn. Don't die. <laughs> we were coming back from popcorn. We were coming back from Ned Devines, and we were both kind of drunk. And we went through the McDonald's drive-thru, and you shouted, like over me, as the hobster, and ordered food. I don't recall that. That never happened. You're, You're making that up just for like berating all of the people of the drive-thru, like, "Hey, you, give me a motherfucking double cheese." <laughs> It did happen, I swear. It just wasn't the last time. It was a time before that. Okay. Uh, I think I might believe you then. It's entirely possible if you're saying we were Ned Devines, because those nights usually end not on a good note. But we haven't been there in a while. (laughs) We have not gone to Ned Devines in a long time, because the last three times we've tried to go there, they were trying to charge $10 admission to get in. I'm like, I'm not paying $10. Nope. Remember that I, I actually snuck myself in? Like, we went onto the that area where Nick was, when Nick was here. That outside area, yeah, I, I, I walked and slid in through there. Then I went inside the door. I'm like, I'm not paying to get in here just because some shitty cover band is playing. You kidding me? You kidding me? Breaking the law, breaking the law. Today, I, I put together a little bit of a flyer for Loy Sauce. Isn't that right, Loy Sauce? What, what was the flyer for? Well, Justin, at Alamo Draft House, D.C. area, on January 27th, we are going to have the man himself, Greg Sestero, a.k.a. Mark from The Room, at the theater, live in person, doing a special presentation, a behind-the-scenes peek inside the room. And uh, he's going to be doing a Q&A, he's going to be doing a book signing, a meet-and-greet, uh, he's going to be showing a behind-the-scenes documentary about the making of The Room and The Disaster Artist. And then afterwards, we're going to ha- be having a screening of The Disaster Artist. Boo! Um, yeah, that's what went out, actually, on the Facebook page. I put up a poll. But um, here's the thing, Justin. The Disaster Artist is easier to book because in order to book The Room, you have to do it directly through Tommy, and he's not the most... Uh, well, he's not on top of it, we'll say. Um, he's a genius, but you know, I'm sure he gets flooded with thousands of requests to show the room every day. So at any rate, it's easier to book because it's through a studio. Also, uh, the Disaster Artist is not readily available to watch on DVD, as is the room. So we want to... And also, it's been nominated for some awards and it's been getting some awards buzz so you know well, i mean it won it won james franco won for playing tommy was at the golden uh, globes yes that's correct but and i'm has saying he's like, gotten a bunch of sexual allegations that he's a pervert and a molester not a molester but a pervert he's not a molester he's just a creep and he's sexually exploiting he's a deviant teenage girls and it's a shame um but at any rate yes so we are showing the disaster artist and it's going to be great. Uh, I've met Greg several times in person, and he's a sweetheart. So I'm pumped for this event. And I'm pumped that I'm able to bring it, you know, bring it to the theater. This is the kind of stuff that makes my job so freaking cool. So I told Nick that we should give... We should give Greg an Epic Film Guys t-shirt. Now, I know other podcasts have had him on. I I know that Nick is not the biggest into having people on to interview them. I have thought about the idea of bringing Greg on our podcast as well, but I, that's just not really – we're not like really in an interview podcast, even though that is a cool thing to do on other shows. 
I don't, I mean, I don't hear you nervously eating those freaking. Well, they're not chips. You said that it sounds like chips. No, no. I swear. I swear. I swear. <laughs> God damn it. Soy sauce. What am I going to do? There's something that we like to do every single week on the Epic Film Guys podcast. We like to call... <gasps> what are you drinking? I'm back. Puke and rally. Yeah. Woo! I am currently drinking a Line and Kugel's Snowdrift Vanilla Porter, and I can certainly taste the vanilla. That's really all I have to say about it. <laughs> Is it that vanilla? Well, first of all, I'm horribly offended by the hard R at the end of vanilla. And, um. Vanilla? That's. Stop it. That's offensive. It tastes good. It tastes like vanilla. Yes. <laughs> I really don't have anything else to say. I like it. It's good. I'll go now. I'm raising my hand. I'll go. I'm drinking go something. It. And it, ladies and gentlemen, we've been recording for over half an hour. Actually, more like 40 some minutes. And I'm still only on my first beer and I'm very proud of myself. I'm drinking the Vale Brewing Company's Henry Deadman. And no, I promised myself that I would drink... A single regular IPA or a pale ale, but no, this is another triple IPA, and it's my last Vale beer. I love this brewery so much. They're one of the best breweries doing my favorite New England style on the East Coast. They're in Richmond, so they're about an hour and a half, two hours from me, but my good buddy Spencer um, came up for the Golden Globes and threw some of those beers at me, and thank you, Spencer, for that. I've been saving this bad boy in the fridge, and this is another quintuple dry hopped beer, but it's a triple IPA. And this thing is like literally bombed with excessive disrespectful amounts of Citra, Mosaic, Galaxy, Amarillo, you name it. There's a ton of stuff in this thing. It really smells and tastes just like straight up tropical fruit juice with almost no alcohol presence. And it is right up there again at 11% alcohol by volume. Of course, we don't know how many IB or use that it has, but it's delicious. It's tasty. It's dangerous. And I love the label. It's got like a dead guy on it with roses, and it's really rad and totally up my alley. Loisas, you had a chance to see a new movie that just hit theaters this last weekend that Nick and I unfortunately did not have the opportunity to see. Proud Mary, you have a little mini review prepared for our listeners. Tell us what this movie's all about and what you thought of the film. Well, gentlemen, um, from the acclaimed director of the hit film London Has Fallen... Uh, comes Proud Mary, which is about Mary, uh, played by Taraji P. Henson, who is a hit woman for an organized crime family. And when an assassination goes bad, uh, she takes a young boy named Danny, played by Jahi Diallo Winston, under her wing. And in doing so, she unwittingly ignites a gang war that puts Danny in jeopardy. So Mary must leap into action, eventually, in order to protect him. Now, when the promotional materials for Proud Mary first surfaced, um, I became very excited. I think Taraji P. Henson is a terrific actress, and especially after Hidden Figures, I was ready to see her kick ass in her own, you know, John Wick style action franchise. Uh, and furthermore, the print campaign was very much influenced by 1970s black exploitation cinema. The posters had all these bright colors, purples and oranges, with this flowery font that was very retro. And one poster even featured um, a tableau taking the shape of a large afro around uh, Taraji P. Henson's head. So I was hoping that this would be kind of a cool modern throwback to films of the era like uh, Coffee, uh, Foxy Brown, TNT Jackson, Black Mama, White Mama... It could have been a blast with the right direction, the right aesthetic, the right soundtrack. Um, so I went to the cinema. I bought a ticket with my hard-earned money. I got my popcorn. I got hunkered down uh, for what could have been a really fun time at the movies. And, well, I feel like this movie should have been called Rollin', Rollin', 
rolling on a river. <laughs> I was so bored. I was so bored. This film is a mess and a half. It is so lethargically, half-heartedly, like just, just, just presented to its audience. A majority of the film involves people standing or sitting in rooms that are lit by sunlight uh, trickling in through Venetian blinds, so everything is shadowy and backlit, and it just looks awful. And the dialogue is nothing but leaden, vaguely defined exposition regarding these crime families that seems to go on for centuries. And speaking of centuries, the actor they have delivering most of this exposition is Danny Glover. God bless him. And Danny Glover, uh, forgive me for saying so, uh, but he just looks so, so old and so tired. And he's mumbling his lines like he has a mouthful of jelly beans and a throat full of gravel. <laughs> and he looks for all the world like he just he's just so desperate to take a nap. The score sounds like stock music you get on those royalty-free music websites. And the editing is so sloppy and haphazard. Like there's literally literally the the ending scene of the movie you know normally how they have like post credit scenes where the where the the ending scene is playing while the credits scroll like next to it like it's in its own little window this movie just has the ending scene of the movie and the credits just go over it like in the middle of the frame so like you can't even see the actors the, the credits are just rolling on top of it it's so bizarre and it feels like footage was just cut out from a, a once longer perhaps more substantial perhaps not cut. Um, also, this action movie has approximately one action sequence. What? Are you serious? <laughs> uh, yeah, well, yes, because a lot of it is just Taraji P. Henson walking into a room and shooting someone in the head, like pointing the gun and just shooting. The, like, there's no, like, kinetic choreographed action. It's just... Taraji P. Henson walks in a room, shoots a guy. Um, but there's one proper action sequence which occurs at the end of the film, and it's over far too quickly. But this is when the needle drops on Tina Turner's cover of Proud Mary, and we finally, after eons of waiting, <laughs> we we finally get to see Mary, you know, run dudes over with her car, shoot dudes in the kneecaps, do all sorts of, you know, flips and, and sliding on the ground and shooting her guns. And it's cool and it's exciting. And you're like, yes, where was this? Where was this movie? I wanted to see this movie. Um, and that's really the only action that you get is when the movie's almost over. Um, so it's it's truly bizarre. I mean, the, the heart of this film really comes from the sort of foster mother-son relationship that develops between the characters of Mary and Danny, which is actually very genuine and sweet and feels like it is in a completely different movie than the one we're watching. And I, I, I blame the film's marketing for that because going in, I was expecting a story of this, you know, lone wolf, badass assassin who, you know, takes no prisoners. And instead it's like this sobering melodrama about motherhood. Um, so ultimately it becomes a film uh, for no one. I mean, it won't satisfy people wanting to see a melodrama because the, because the movie's only 80 minutes long, and that brisk runtime doesn't allow for the drama to develop in any kind of satisfactory way. And it won't satisfy action fans, because you have to wait until the movie's almost over for effectively the first action scene. And, it, you know, of course, by then it's too little too late. So it has this kind of bizarre identity crisis going on. And it's a shame, because this film just is such a colossal waste of Taraji P. Henson's you know, immense talents. And she tries her, her dandest and, you know, she survives this movie with her, her dignity intact. 
But Mary is just is simply not a compelling character because she's so thinly sketched. Like, there's nothing to this character. She isn't permitted by the screenplay to be the badass we want her to be until the very end of the picture. I am all for an action franchise uh, starring a strong, take care of business woman of color. You know, um, I'm I was so desperately wanting a film uh, where. In this world where we have, you know, a serious problem with representation in, in Hollywood, I could I could be proud to support a film featuring, you know, one of our most capable black actresses, you know, in a starring vehicle. Because that stuff matters to me, you know. Um, so I wanted to go out and support this film because I'm like, hey, co- hey, cool, you know, Proud Mary, you know, an action film starring a black woman. That that's that's rad. But unfortunately, this movie is is not worthy of that distinction or of any distinction for that matter. It's boring. So uh, I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to give this movie a a three out of 10. What? (laughs) Whoa. Okay. Okay. Can I change my rating? Maybe a four out of 10. I just, there's nothing. There's nothing. There's that one. There's this one really cool action sequence towards the end. Taraji B. Henson's great in it. The kid's great in it. There's a lot of really nice scenes of them just talking, but that's the movie. It's just talking. Yeah. uh, Proud Mary. (laughs) Well, then, you've heard it first from epic film guy Loisos. Proud Mary. I know nobody else that has seen this film, personally, other than people that are out there doing what we do, podcasting, reviewing movies as our side living. So... You took one for the team, Lois Ross, and I totally know where you're coming from. I actually thought the posters and everything looked amazing. I was really interested in it until I saw the trailer, and then I, I, I had to like find it myself. It was not played in the theater with any other film that I had seen. And yeah, this and the guy- trailer did the trailer did not um, actually represent like the print campaign at all. I felt like that was a little deceiving to me. Um, but you know, it's a lie. It's a total lie. Total lie. Glad you got to see it, and unfortunately, I'm sorry to hear you didn't like it, but right now, that's our cue, Nick. We're going to take a little bit of a break real quick, and then when we come back, we're going to be reviewing Guillermo del Toro's The Shape of One. This week in epic film history... Hey, you know, I went down to the corner store, I grabbed me a PBR, I just felt like it was a proper, appropriate thing to have for tonight's podcast, it was only $1.99, not really, <laughs> um, actually I'm drinking, <laughs> I would hang up on you right now, and Nick, oh my Nick, lord, it's so big, you, it's you so, so big, I don't even think that I could fit it. Down my throat or up my ass. It's fucking huge. I don't know if I've taken that large of a cock. I mean, of a subject in any one day. So it is huge. And Justin wanted me to come in and comfort you and rub the back of your neck and maybe just slide my hand down your pants a little bit. Hey, dude, get, get out of here. Get out of here. Get, get out of here. <laughs> no, I said no. I said, oh, God. They also have a way to call in and record a question, which is a very unique way to connect with fans. So don't miss that opportunity, even though we haven't had a new fan views voicemail since Patrick Swayze's ghost called in. No, 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 no. It wasn't Patrick Swayze's ghost. It was Santa Swayze's ghost. <laughs> Santa Swayze. Oh, I swear oh, to God, oh, I'm oh. listening to the episode and it's just like, oh, ho, oh, oh, ho, oh, ho, everybody, I'm Patrick Swayze. It's like, come on, man. Get the fucking impression right. God, uh, Jesus. Fuck you. Go to... go. Uh, wait, which one? Was it Go Watch a Movie or I Married a Movie Geek? Uh, so I Married a Movie Geek. Movie yeah, Geek so, Cast but, on Twitter. Is Justin dude, no. from there. I, I, I love those guys. I love really, it. Really? He and his wife do that show. They're amazing. It, mm-hmm. it is less a script than it is a jumbled mess of words tossed onto a page by someone whose writing clocks in somewhere between a Dora the Explorer episode and a documentary about sand although saying as much as an insult to people who write Dora and Sand documentaries. It is insulting. <laughs> and I, I mean this very truthfully, too, because, I mean, again, I got a fucking degree in this shit. I've studied film. I've studied film writing. Okay, It's insulting to anyone who has ever studied or practiced the craft of writing, particularly screenplays. 
it's basically a checklist of don'ts for a Hollywood screenwriter. And the assumption by Affleck that he can skate the entire story of this film on meaningless narration is just, it makes me sick. It really does. He should be fucking embarrassed for this piece of shit. He should apologize personally to every amazing actor and every amazing crew person. The production design in this film is also fantastic. Period setting. Fantastic. I can't say enough good things about everything else in the film. All the pieces were there. All of the elements were definitely there. But he should also personally apologize to every single person, i.e. me, who sat in a theater and had to suffle through this fucking flapping piece of shit. <laughs> Investment in characters, Dan. It begins and ends with living and breathing with those characters throughout their life moments up on the screen, not telling the audience about them in passing. Okay? It's utterly lost and it's a nonsensical heap and it belongs in a garbage can next to a Walmart bargain bin buried underneath half-filled slushies and a case of expired Greek yogurt. No one should see this fucking movie. No one. Hi. We're back. Crickets. That's right. Oh, no, no, I no crickets. The button. I, Why did they here? push the button? I always know. I don't really want you to push the button. I, I, I want our listeners to know. I know what know button you want me to push. We're alive. Uh, yeah, no. We're I'm here. Not, I'm not going to do it. We're, we're awake. We're full of energy for you guys. And we're about to talk about a movie. That's right. A movie because we are at our core a movie podcast. Lois Sauce, what movie are we talking about tonight? We are going to be talking about Guillermo del Toro's The Shape of Water. A movie that you actually saw before anyone that I know saw. When, when was it you saw the film? It was a long time ago. I saw the film in July? No, that can't be right. I saw it in September. It was in September. You pie I saw you're a piece of shit. That's right, you <laughs> are. All right, c- cut all that out. I saw it in September. <laughs> Game over, I saw man. it in September, Justin. It's not game over, Nick. It's not game over. Well, Nick, you actually just finally had a chance to see the film this evening. Uh, those of our listeners that have listened to our best of 2017 episode know that it was my number one film of the year. And if I recall, Boy Sauce, it was also your number one film of the year. Is that correct? Uh, it was. Uh, it was my number one way before it was ever your number one. So just saying. Okay, Nick. Well, are you ready for this review, my friend? Are you gonna Are you gonna cough yourself to death? Are you gonna live after your two miles? <laughs> I don't understand what the laughing's about. Why are you gonna start bringing laughter into it? I, 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 everything. I, I mean, we're about to I'm review a serious you. movie about a serious love between a serious mute woman and a serious fish man thing. What the hell he was is a that fish thing? man? <laughs> It's a gill man. I mean, it's basically to, for those of our listeners that don't know what this movie is about. It is a fantasy drama film directed by Guillermo del Toro. He wrote the film, um, and it is about a, a mute custodian at a high security government laboratory who basically befriends and falls in love with an amphibian creature, um, and then she eventually plans to free the creature, and then well hijinks ensue but this is actually uh the concept that del toro gave to universal when they asked him to come in to talk about remaking creature from the black lagoon he had had this in his head for a long time and no one really else agreed that it was a good idea uh, to, to take that particular version of the character that way and that route and so Universal said no, and so he opted to not do the remake for Universal. And years later, he wrote and directed this beautiful piece of cinema, and that is what The Shape of Water is in a nutshell. So I've talked about it a little bit on the show. I've gushed about it. Lois has gushed about it a little bit. But Nick, this is your this is your opportunity because this is you coming right off of watching it this evening. What were your initial thoughts on the shape of water. Uh, it definitely wouldn't be my number one film of the year. I, I don't think I could find a way to squeeze it in there above Dunkirk or Disaster Artist, but this would easily land top five. This was a beautiful film. Uh, and it's not even, you could remove the actors from this film entirely and just just to immerse yourself in the music, the, the score, the soundtrack in this film is incredible. And just how picturesque and how utterly gorgeous 
everything about this movie is. It's just a, a full credit to Guillermo del Toro for just what a creative genius he is. And he won, of course, Best Director at the Golden Globes. He's definitely That's right. an easy favorite to take the statue home at the Oscars for this film. And you can really, really see why, because this, from the top down, you can really see the entire thing that you watch. It's his vision. And it, like I said, you could just remove the actors from the picture entirely, which we're going to talk about the actors because there's a lot of fantastic performances here as well. But even without all of that, it's still such a beautiful film. It's it's such a a piece of art to, to sit down and watch. It's one of those films where you just kind of awed at everything that went into, say, the production design to the way that a certain scene was lit to where the cameras were placed when they made these shots. It's just fantastic. So many, so many good decisions here. So yeah, hats off to Guillermo del Toro for this amazing film, but let's, we could dig into performances on this. We can dig into, yeah. I mean, I, I don't necessarily feel like we need to spoil the plot of this film because you know, we can we can we can I mean, save well, that well, if nobody's well, ever seen you, the movie. You, I really want them exactly. to experience it for themselves. But. Well, like you just said, um, you get the first chance to see it tonight for yep. the first time, and it hasn't even fully opened in your market yet. Um, Loisaw saw it at a special event because he works for Alamo Draft House. He's special. I mean, we love Loisaw. Loisaw. <laughs> is is he dying over there? Is he dying? Um, but and I had a chance to see it. Um, and I'm the guy that I love Alamo Draft House as well. I love the brand. Um, I like to watch everything I possibly can at that theater. But I actually went out of my way to see this at Angelica Film Center and had to deal with some rude ass theater uh, employees because we are getting too close to the Shape of Water uh, cardboard standout thing. Um, but in reality, I just could not wait to see this movie. Um, so. We don't want to spoil it. We're not going to do a full spoilerish review. Uh, we'll get into it as as deep as we can, um, and give you an idea what the film's all about and what we think about it. But it's the film to see, most definitely. If you see any movie in the theater um, from here on out in 2018, make sure this one is at the top of your priority list. But we're going to get into performances, and as, as Nick just said there, and um, I'm going to throw it to you, Loy Sauce, on your thoughts on Sally Hawkins, who is our main character in the film. Well, Sally Hawkins is the love of my life. First of all, I'm just getting that out of the way. But also, it's really difficult to carry a film, especially when you have no dialogue. No spoken dialogue, I should say. Uh, because Sally Hawkins' character, she is mute in the film. Uh, and thus, every everything through her performance is communicated through her facial expressions, uh, her eyes, and, and of course her use of sign language in the film, which I think was used very effectively. Um, so I I have to commend Sally Hawkins. I mean, she gives one of my favorite performances of of the whole year. She she's just so um, she's so incredible. She has she has a a range of emotions in this film that you can just tell from her face it's so expressive it's so, her eyes are so soulful and they communicate so much about the character and um it, it's it's honestly brilliant it's a stroke of brilliance her performance i totally agree and um when i first watched the film i mean i had watched the trailers uh to great detail because i could not wait for this i don't think i was ready honestly, for how great her performance was. I know that she's got a lot of competition uh, for the Oscars, and I know she didn't get the love that a lot of people thought she would get at the Golden Globes. But I mean, it's it's a hard performance, um, and I think she did it with such ease, um, but such perfection, because every facial expression Every little mannerism, every little movement she does, like you can feel her emotion. You can feel what she's going through. You can totally relate to this character, even though she doesn't speak, as you said, a spoken word throughout the entire film. Um, I loved her in this movie. She was just beautiful. Um, I was so sad in so many uh, scenes in the film because of the fact that she couldn't speak. But you know what? I thought about it after I saw it, and I'm like, you know, this makes the character stronger because she is so intelligent, um, and she's that much more expressive, and she doesn't even have to use words to express herself. Um, I mean, I'm going to go on a limb here and just say, like, she's definitely one of my favorites um, for a Best Actress 
win at the Oscars. I don't know if she's going to get it, but I absolutely loved her. It's one of my favorite performances of the year. And I think that without her performance and without her dedication to this film and what this film is all about, the film would be nowhere near as good as it was. Yeah. And I, I Why do you always copy agree. me. Yeah, you son of a bitch. Stop copying loy sauce. <laughs> You were saying, Nick? I was just going to say, I completely agree with both of you guys. Uh, she is definitely the centerpiece of this film. Uh, going back to what Loisa said, especially with how expressive she is emotionally, even without any dialogue, it's the testament to a great actor that they can really carry a performance without saying any words. And to jump from Sally Hawkins over to another actor that I want to talk about in this film that also does this, even though he had a lot of dialogue, is Michael Shannon, who is oh, continually God. one of my favorite actors. He one has been favorites. one of my favorite actors uh, ever since I first saw him in Revolutionary Road. That was the first time he ever popped onto my radar, and I have loved him in pretty much everything I've ever seen him in since. And, God, he's he's just good. He's so good. He's so threatening in this film like the presence that he exudes and the menace that he exudes and like some of those scenes and i won't talk about him in explicit detail but like the scene when he's in zelda's house dude like oh my like, god he dude. is fucking the power scary dude immense power and this yes. is what you need from a villain in a film is just to be able to convey the sense of menace and the sense of 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 a threat and fear and just like you know they're unhinged they could go any way at any time and it's a complete testament to the genius of michael shannon i i'm surprised i mean Obviously, Sally Hawkins is amazing in this film, and she should get every accolade that's going to come her way for the performance. But I'm surprised I haven't heard Shannon's name mentioned more in I agree in, in, yeah, in circles I, for awards and stuff like that, because he definitely, definitely acted his ass off in this thing. And God, he, he can he can go from one role to another, completely transform every single time he does a new role. And it's just amazing. He's great. In you know, this. great, Nick, great, think- great. I think the reason why is that we've seen him play similar characters before in a way. Um, definitely not to the extent where he is because he plays Colonel Richard Strickland in the film who basically oversees this project uh, where Eliza works, um, where they're housing Mr. Gilman himself, the amphibian creature. But he takes it even further in this. We've seen him play very threatening characters in the past. Believe me, he's played great villains. But I feel like this is probably his best pass at doing that because, as you just said perfectly, um, whenever he's on screen, you're wondering what this guy's going to do next. But I have to say this. My favorite villains are the ones that don't think they're villains, that don't even think what they're doing is necessarily bad. Maybe they're halfway there. But the whole point of what they're doing is in their mind the greater good. Um, and that's what this character represents to me. The film takes place during a time when doing the right thing may not always be doing the right thing for everyone, but it may just be for a special small cause, maybe just for your personal gain. And there was not a moment in that film that I could not wait to see what Shannon was going to do next. There's a whole thing in the movie Um this is the only spoiler that I'm going to let out right off the bat, but okay. So Michael Shannon is a very brutal character in this thing. He does not like the Gill man. He does not like this amphibious creature, which we're going to get to in a little bit here. I'm going to let Loisos lead that off in a little bit. Um, but his finger becomes missing for some special reason. And the finger rots throughout the film. It gets sewn back on. And then by the end of the film, it basically rots itself off. Um, and I just saw that as like a deterioration of the character of who that person was yep. and like Perfect. how he just basically at that point when the finger falls off, he blows up and he lets everything go. And that's when we see that character climax and we'll just leave it at that. I don't want to spoil anything else from there, but I loved that whole imagery and that whole th- idea of seeing the finger cut off and then he attaches it back and he tries to become who he was before and he never does. And Loisos, thoughts on Shannon as Colonel Richard Strickland? You guys said it all. I mean, he's great. <laughs> so we'll go ahead and get to the amphibian in the room or in the water, as I should say, 
Doug Jones as Amphibian Man, who I like to call Gill Man. He's played an Amphibian Man before in the Hellboy films, um, which I've loved dearly. He is such a great character actor, and he loves to do creatures. He's so good at it. What, do you, what did you think of Doug Jones, and what did you think of the character of Gill Man in The Shape of Water? Well, again, uh, such a range of emotions that the character has to portray. I mean, he starts out being mysterious. He can be terrifying. Uh, he he can be uh, tender and sweet. Like, there's so many facets to this to this character, and it's again, it's difficult in a film to really make the audience connect with a creature, uh, an otherworldly creature. I mean, we've seen, you know. Uh, from King Kong and, and uh, other, other films that, that feature a, a monster and the, you connect with them, you, you identify with the monster and the creature and, and uh, but it's incredibly difficult to pull off. But again, that performance with Doug Jones, which um, very minimal, hardly any CGI uh, used in that. I mean, it's Doug Jones in the latex costume, um, of course, with the with some of the enhancements in the face are, are CGI, but um, that performance is is again uh, re- really what uh, elevate the movie into into something that's really endearing and really special, and and uh, to sympathize with with this creature who is incredibly dangerous. Like the, you, you get the sense that this creature can kill you know but the fact that you completely buy that there's a romance that develops between these two is is pretty incredible and and one of the reasons why it's one of my favorites is of the year is uh the fact that we've seen monsters in other films and especially going back to creature from the black lagoon which this film is somewhat based on um the fact that the monster is seen as fearsome. Uh, Guillermo del Toro sympathizes with the monster, and he he has said this, but he he has always felt more connected to the monsters in in, in those old films, uh, and that permeates throughout the the entire film. The fact that you know the monster gets the girl in this one, <laughs> so uh, so you can feel del Toro how he feels a kindred spirit in, in monsters and this monster in particular. Um, I think it's extraordinary. I definitely agree with you. 100% being a fan of monsters, of creature features of, you know, the same stuff that Del Toro himself grew up on. Um, it, this for me was a love letter to those films, but it enhanced it. It's it, he took what could have been otherwise like a very generic movie it made it truly special. Um, you, we fall in love with the creature. Um, Liza falls in love with the creature. And it kind of questions. It, it, it begs the answer. Like, what makes us human? What? A lot of us have pets. A lot of us love animals. I love my animals. But what what makes us so special on this planet? About our connection to other living creatures, other living beings. Like, um I liked that I asked those questions and seeing a being like this, that is so close to being human, but so, so much more uh, above us in, in the idea that it's so much more strong. Um, it's more advanced than we are. I, 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 I kept thinking throughout the whole movie. Like I, I hadn't at that point, the entire rest of the year thought so much during a movie when I sat down to watch it in theaters, like it kept begging different questions in my head. Like, you know, what makes us human? Like what makes us so special? And um, going back to what you said, being a fan of practical effects, you got to just love seeing Doug Jones in this so perfectly fluid in that costume and seeing every little moment, every little manners, everything that he did in that costume so perfectly blended um, with the rest of the actors and the rest of the amazing amazing things that the production design in this film. Oh my God. It's just outrageously beautiful. I loved that whole part of the movie. It, it was, it was perfection to me. Yeah. And it's a, it's a good word 
to use to describe a lot of the aspects of this film. It's it's just breathtaking. It's so picturesque. It's so just perfect from from beginning to end. I echo everything you guys said about Doug Jones there. It's amazing to see him in in the, in that suit and it's amazing. You know, you completely you never for a moment question the relationship between these two and question that, you know, they do have a very distinct romantic connection. You never for a moment, you, you'd never for a moment deny that, you know, especially and, when you see things that you, you probably yeah. would question as, as a film goer, as a human, when you see certain things happen in this film, you know, you don't though. You're like, wow, I went there and you accept it pretty quickly. And yeah. I did at least. Yeah. you. I, I think you do. I think you do. It, it, it makes complete sense in terms of the way that the story unfolds. It makes complete sense in terms of the performances that the actors are giving. It's just, it, it's note perfect in, in so many different ways. There's probably maybe like one or two minute little things that I can nitpick out of it, but I mean, why bother? I mean, there's, there's so much good about this film that it really deserves to be pretty much up toward the top of everybody's best of the year list. There's no reason. I mean, it was you guys' favorite of the year. I would still probably, like I said, put it between number three and number four, somewhere in there. I haven't really digested it enough to say for sure where it would land if I could redo my list today, but it's, it's, it's so, so, so beautiful. And I want to talk about the music in this film for a moment and like a lot of the th- flourishes and a lot of the touches and a lot of the homages to really old school entertainment to really old school like black and white hollywood and and it's uh all the you know the music most of the music is foreign which i love it's just so breathtakingly beautiful the songs i didn't have a chance to look it up unfortunately before we recorded but but this is one of those film soundtracks that i would listen to again and again and again because it's just breathtaking and the score by alexander Desplat was just amazing it was beautiful it's tragic but yet when i listen to it loy sauce it comforts me i could listen to it when i go to sleep um when we were prepping last week nick for our most anticipated of 2018, I was just listening to the score before you were ready to record. And the the week before that, when we did our best of 2017, I was just listening to the score. I have it saved on my computer here that I'm recording on now. And I just keep listening to it. And I'm just addicted to it. I'm obsessed with it. Um, I have not gotten the opportunity to do like a top five or top 10 of my favorite film scores of the year for 2017. But this is definitely up there for me because it's quirky, but it's like got that traditional, like you just said, that traditional cinematic feel to it, like full orchestral feel to it. Um, but it also feels like perfect as a background for a movie about a monster. But is he really a monster is the question that I keep asking myself. You or know? is man the monster? Yes, yes, yes. Um. Yeah, I mean... Uh... Beautiful score. Uh, I love the the references to old Hollywood musicals. I mean, that's that's kind of my wheelhouse anyway. So to see that so lovingly celebrated in this film is um is such a treat. Um, you, Justin, you mentioned the production design. I mean, this film captures Baltimore so perfectly. I know, um, isn't that crazy? Because we're only like an hour from that. Yeah, the city right now. So yeah, and and just the 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 aesthetic, the colors, the beautiful, like the the fact that it lingers on the these little nuances, um, like uh, Eliza, Sally Hawkins' character, um, kind of tracking the the movement of the droplets of water on the on the bus window just little things like that you just soak in and it just completely transports you to this to this time and place that's um uh, nostalgic and i mean i wasn't even born in that era and i can still because this takes place in the in the in the 60s that's right um and, and but but i feel i i yearn for i ache for that 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 time and i want to visit i want to go back yeah. yeah exactly so um you know, it, it's again. You just kind of let it let it take you away. 
it, it takes you to a different, different place in more ways than one. And I actually love the fact that this was a period piece. Um, and I, I really liked the idea that Del Toro infused with it being like during the Cold War in the early 60s. Like it really resonated with what was going on during that time. Yeah, there's a lot with, of like espionage and intrigue yeah. in this movie. <laughs> but I'm a huge period piece fanatic regardless like even if a movie's not very good like i love seeing we've talked about this many times before on the show and i've talked in person with you about it Lysos, but i love when a movie like to get the wardrobe down they get the sets down like even like the diner in this movie like it's every little minute detail is just perfected um you don't ever question it like when i go to the movies i like to be transported i like to forget what I'm doing that day and forget what I'm doing the next day and forget about work the next week. And this movie did more than that. It took me to a place like that, to a different world, to a different time, but also gave me amazing characters, beautiful characters. This film made me cry. This film gave me fantastic suspense. It had me on the edge of my seat. Let's not forget, like, there, aside from the love in this film, the love story, that is, there's some truly frightening moments in this movie. As we talked about with Michael Shannon, there's a lot of great suspenseful scenes in the film. It's the perfect package. I mean, I don't know anything else that I could ask for out of this kind of movie. Um and Del Toro's finally hit the nail on the head for me, and I've loved a lot of his past work. He is a visionary director. He is literally one of the best directors working in Hollywood right now. I wish that, you know, maybe out of like the past five projects he's chosen, uh, he didn't make the movies that he made. We're not going to mention that one title there, Nick, or there might be a little segment of Nick's rants on the show because we know how much he likes to talk about that one. But I have no to idea be what fair, you're talking about. Oh, I think you do. <sighs> oh, you do. Oh, you do. Ah, its sequel hits theaters in like what, a month and a half or something. We're not going to talk about Del it. But I mean, turned it down to direct this film, for which we should exactly. all be so immensely happy. grateful. I'm so excited! I'm so excited about this movie. I'm so excited to talk about it again because I loved it so much. It is my number one of the year. I don't know if you guys have any other closing thoughts about the film. I thought. Uh, and a side note here, real quick: the rest of the cast. I mean, the rest of the cast is brilliant in this thing. Richard Jenkins as Giles in this movie is just fantastic. Octavia Spencer as Zelda in the movie. I mean, I the love whole Octavia cast Spencer. Is just literally. So much. I, I can't. I can't deny and Michael anything Stuhlbarg in the movie. as well as Hofstetter was love also yep. fantastic oh, so in this film. I love him. He he was absolutely amazing in this. And then you have, you know, it's again, it's set during the Cold War, so you have that whole kind of McCarthyism era of the of the United States history kind of playing a little bit of a role in this film as well. It's 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 a lot of these different factors. Justin's exactly right. There's love, there's suspense, there's, you know, some limited action and stuff like that. And it really does kind of bring you to the edge of your seat because you never really know exactly where the film is going to go next and yeah, no, I don't really have anything else to say about it. Like I said, it was one of the best films of the year. Absolutely fantastic. I throw a 9 out of 10 on it. Uh, and, you know, move over to you guys to uh, go ahead and close it out. Yeah, I'll go second and step with you right there. And I'm pretty sure I've mentioned on the show before, but I may have been too drunk to remember <laughs> my rating of the movie. But it is definitely a nine out of ten for me. I absolutely love that it. It's brilliant. Um, definitely my number one of the year. And uh, I can't wait to watch it on. Guess what? 4K Ultra HD Blu-ray on my 4K TV. Fuck off, Because I'm that guy. Hey, Dan, we knew, you and I talked about 4K TVs recently, and you talked about how you're going to buy yours next year, so no reason to be mad at me. Blaisos, what's your rating of The Shape of Water, my friend? Oh, man. Um, well, I think I'm going to... <sighs> the, the way I view this film is, like, like Del Toro is so good at creating like fairy tales for adults. Like this is the kind of movie that feels like a bedtime story that would have been read to me growing up, but it's for adults and it's, um, it plays out pretty much as you would expect. It's like that, like a bedtime story in a way where, you know, like it, it's just a very comfortable thing where, you know, it's all going to turn out right in the end. Um, but you still get this magical feeling, uh, when you're imagining the, the, the world in in your head, and Del Toro's vision is so uh, so vivid, and so it's such a beautiful film. Um, so I think, I mean, I, I don't have anything bad to say about it. Um, 
like The Conjuring 2, I'm just going to go ahead and give this a perfect score. I think this movie deserves wow. a 10 out of 10. Not surprised there. Not surprised in a great score. Um, that said, to piggyback off that as we end the segment, Loisos, very much in line with what you just said, this is a quote from Del Toro himself. This movie is a healing movie for me. For nine movies, I rephrased the fears of my childhood, the dreams of my childhood, and this is the first time I speak as an adult about something that worries me as an adult. I speak about trust, otherness, sex, love, where we're going. These are not concerns that I had when I was nine or seven. So you definitely nailed it. This is how I felt about Del Toro becoming a director in his own and he finally nailed it. He finally had his true vision. Now, I love Pan's Labyrinth. I do love it, but I'm going to be the minority here and say that I actually liked The Shape of Water more. It resonated <sighs> more with me. I know. I know. Pan's I mean, Labyrinth, Pan's is a Labyrinth masterpiece. doesn't have gratuitous amounts of Sally Hawkins naked in it. So That is it, ladies and gentlemen. That is our review of dick. The Shape of Water. I don't know if that happened. Did that really happen? I don't know. I wanted to see it, but he never lets it out that we could see it. I really wanted to see if it had like gills on it too, if like it breathed on its own kind of thing, like it's its own separate piece. <laughs> How horrible am I? <laughs> We're going to go ahead and run into a quick break. We're going to come back. We've got one trailer to talk about in Epic Previews, and then we're going to wrap out the show. We'll be right back. The Angry Old Man Podcast is a, is a one-man uh, vo voice characterization and improvisational uh, company. And we're back. Yo, once again, like it or not. Oh, I like it. Oh, you do like it? Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, Jesus Christ. I'm happy to hear that, Cheeks. <laughs> yeah. Our buddies at Epic Film Guys Podcast. Oh, ah, yes. Uh, Nick and Justin. Yes, yes. Uh, didn't they just give us another shout out? Uh, oh, and we really yeah, they did. It. Well, yes, of course. Nicholas, uh, not Cage, but oh. Nicholas from Epic Film Guys gave us another lovely, lovely yeah. shout out on their commercial. On their commercial? Yeah. What the hell you mean on their commercial? I mean on their podcast. They gave us oh, a commercial. They gave us a commercial yes. on their podcast. They gave us a little plug. Yes, they did. Yes, and you know how she loves to get plugged. Oh, God, yes. <laughs> Cheeks, honey, what the hell do you mean you like to well, get plugged? She likes to get plugs on the radio. She yeah. likes for people to do yeah. To talk about her. What, right. what plugs are you talking about? Exactly. Yeah, I was thinking of a different kind of a plug. Oh, that yeah. kind. That she Always. loves. Well, yes. Yeah, she does uh, love yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. So, Epic Film Guys yeah. gave us uh, a nice little plug on their podcast. Nice plug, yeah. Except, what? I don't think that Justin mm. is a listener and a big fan of mine yeah. like uh, Nicholas. Oh, oh. Really? What, why do you say yeah. that? Yes, because, why? Uh, you know, at least I know for sure that Nicholas did listen to uh, all the available podcasts did? that we have on our website wow. right. at www.angryoldmanpodcast.com. Of course. But Justin... What about him? Well, he just kind of goes along and goes, uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. Oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is, is that how he does it? goes, <laughs> <laughs> Is that how Justin does yes, it? Yes, he does. Uh -huh. He goes, <laughs> <laughs> No, he doesn't. But I don't think that he listens. He does, not well, he does not. No. He just, at least that's not the impression that I'm getting. Oh, uh, Nicholas. Yes. All the love to you, Nicholas. Well, what the hell do you mean all the love to Nicholas? <laughs> that's not. The, well, what about me? I don't mean that kind of a yeah, love. Not that kind oh. of. Not that kind of. No, love. the professional oh, love. Yeah. Professional. Kind that's of right. Love. The professional <laughs> kind of love. Well, that's okay. Yeah, yeah. He means nothing. He to means me. nothing. nothing. To Except in a professional sort of way. Yes, yeah. only in the professional yes. sort of way. Well, that's good. <laughs> Justin, uh, I'm withholding. Withholding. Until I see further. Evidence. Uh, oh, and Justin, she can withhold. Mm, believe oh, oh, yeah, she can <laughs> really oh, withhold. Can. And welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for sticking with us here on the Epic Film Guys podcast. We're going to do something really special right now, something that we love to do on the show. Hey, Loy Sauce, what's that thing that we love to do? It's called Epic Previews. In the world of Endicott, New York, and Herndon, Virginia. Two epic film guys dissect the latest movie trailers in a segment we like to call Epic Previews. Okay, Louis Sauce. 
So the trailer we're going to be talking about this week on the show is for a little film called Summer of 84. And it's a movie that, yes, Nick, you gave me shit about it on our Facebook page when I posted the trailer. It should have been on my most anticipated of 2018 list, but the trailer had not hit yet when we recorded that episode. Not that that's any reason for me to exclude it, but... I totally forgot about it, and I'm so excited that the trailer hit this week. All right, this comes from the same team, Loisos, that did one of our favorite movies, The Whole Reason Why We've Met, The Whole Reason Why You're an Epic Film Guy, that little movie called Turbo Kid. Um, They're involved, and they're doing this movie. It's about a group of teens that suspect that their neighbor that's a police officer is a serial killer. They spend their entire summer spying on him and gathering evidence, but they get closer to discovering the truth. And of course, hijinks ensue and things get dangerous. So voice sauce, you got to tell me right off the bat. How did you feel about this trailer, man? If I've learned anything it's that people hardly ever let you know who they really are. Inside any house, anything could be happening, and you'd never know. You think a bunch of glorified Care Bears and Hoods could take down the Empire? They are aliens, and they're highly intelligent. Scientifically the perfect woman. There's a serial killer on the loose. What else could possibly be this exciting? Mackie is the Cape May Slayer. Dude, Mackie's a cop with a sick reputation. That's why it's so genius. The suburbs are where the craziest shit happens. Well, I think this film looks terrific. Um, I watched an interview with the, with the directors of the film, a trio. They go collectively by the name of RKSS. Um, and they said it kind of starts out as the Spielbergian kind of freewheeling 80s comedy. Uh, but it soon gets very dark and very intense. And it looks like from the look of the trailer that children die, which... Oh, yes. Which you know is... That's your thing, man. That's, <laughs> everyone that listens to the show knows that your favorite thing in a horror film is to see young children in danger. Not only in danger, but you love to see them disemboweled, beheaded. That's true. You That's like true. to see them cut up, chopped up into little itty bitty pieces. I mean, the poster says every serial killer lives next door to someone. And it, that made me so excited to see that. I mean, I, I like that. The trailer has that 80s nostalgia. It's going to have that amazing score by Limatos, who yes. I got to see live last year in Brooklyn um, with Carpenter Brute. They did the score for Turbo Kid. They're a, a synth wave group. And you can hear the, those notes in this trailer. Um, the, the main thing that I, I, I worry about here with this trailer is that I feel like a lot of people are going to look at this and go, Stranger Things, it because it's a group of teenage kids. we But, you know, uh, Lois Oss, as we know, being lovers of 80s cinema, there were a shitload of movies in the 80s about teen kids doing crazy things. There's Monster Squad. There's Stand By Me. It, it, you know, you, you name them right off the bat. There's a whole ton of them. Um, Fright Night, which this film kind of bears similarity to yeah, as well. Yeah, and even a more modern movie like Disturbia, um, you know, where you have some uh, someone watching another house and even a movie you showed me for the Halloween season, Monster House, you know? Uh, you're the next door neighbor to someone or something that you think is uh, something strange is going on and you're paying close attention to it and bad things happen. Actually, the main thing I thought of with this, Loisos, is I literally thought of a modern The Burbs, which is actually yes. getting a, a straight up uh, 4K restoration from Scream Factory <laughs> that comes out in a couple of months, which I'm so excited about. Um, me too. But I mean, for me, like Turbo Kid is the reason why you and I became friends. And I loved that film so much. And I give these guys so much credit because with that film, especially, they nailed the feeling of a film from the the eighties and they got it perfectly down. I feel like it's, it's right there 
in summer of 84 as well. Um, they don't show that much in the film, um, in the trailer, but as you just said, kids in danger, it looks like that's going to happen for real. And my main hope for this is that we actually see some kids get off. I don't want to see these kids all walking around to lie by the end of the movie. And I know that's kind of a really dark, sadistic thing to say, but I mean, let's be fair here. Um, the film is a horror mystery and I want to see some kids get killed. I mean, I, I want to see it brutal. Stranger Things plays it safe. It is mature, um, but it did the next best thing. It ups the ante. We get to see these kids in serious danger and maybe a few kids get off to, in, in the process. So I was really excited to see this trailer hit and I really liked it. Overall, didn't show too much, but it looks like the kids involved are really good young actors. Um, the cinematography looks beautiful. I'm all in 100%. Summer of 84, that shit should have been on my most anticipated list. And of course, it wasn't. Any closing thoughts, Lois, us about the film? Um, closing thoughts. If anyone is listening to this that hasn't seen Turbo Kid uh, yet, yes. come on. You, you got to watch it. Um, it. That's a very special film for me for a multitude of reasons. Uh, but it, it's it's just a great, fun time. Um very extremely gory uh but it has real heart to it there's a real big beating heart behind turbo kid and uh i i adore it so if this film is anything like turbo kid which i you know hope it will be it has all of the ingredients it has le matos um doing that amazing score so i mean i i'm i have high hopes for this one and i can't wait for it i'm gonna uh, hold out for a release date because they haven't announced when it's actually What's going what? to be released. Well, they, they said something about January 2018 originally, but guess what? We're already no, that's there. Not, that's not yeah. happening. So we, we've we heard no word about that. They just finally released the trailer. Um, we'll have to see. That's why, you know, Nick gave me some shit. He was the first one to chime in on the Facebook page and commented when I said, this is on my most anticipated list. He's like, you missed out on your list. Oh, God, God. You know what? This yeah. might even be 2019. We don't know yet. Nick, well, and also um, one one last thing. Uh, you mentioned that people are going to say it's a it's a Stranger Things. It that's ripoff. right. In the this world film, of Stranger Things, they're they're going to do it though because it's so popular. Yeah, but this film was actually in development before uh, Stranger Things became such a huge phenomenon. This was w back in development way back in 2015. You know, so. Uh, way before Stranger Things ever hit the zeitgeist and became the huge thing that it was. So I just want to say, if you're thinking this That's is a, a true statement, sir, this is a reaction to the Stranger Things hype. I think this is hitting at, uh, it, it, you know, there, it's a mixed, it's a double edged sword because it's kind of hitting at exactly the right time when there is all this '80s nostalgia, but it's also hitting at a time when Stranger Things and it have become such big properties, and people will look. With, at this some, as some kind of cheap cash in it's not this was in development way before so i just want to throw that out there you know, uh, i'm I gonna say you doing so you're full of shit loy sauce because 80s nostalgia never existed before stranger things or it, it never existed it was never it did, a thing, but it, ever but not to the not to the level <laughs> that it is now i mean it's i listen to 80s nostalgia every single culture, day of my yeah, life but, yeah justin I mean, jesus christ justin's been jizzing about the 80s since 1990 january 1st <laughs> When Justin was like seven, just spewing everywhere. That was his first wet true. dream about the eighties. Like after it became the nineties, he had his first wet dream about the eighties. <laughs> it's true. I'm glad but I took you know this what? podcast in that direction today. I, I, I have to thank you, the White House publicly on the show, because you were such a kind gentleman. And for my birthday present, all right, hold on. That was Christmas. Actually my Christmas gift. That was my Christmas gift. Um, you bought me the turbo kid collector's edition box set with like a fucking t-shirt and enamel pin the a two year anniversary the, edition the three uh, two imagine that a two year anniversary edition a three <laughs> disc blu-ray uh with nice slip cover case and everything and uh you did right you did right and uh, got me even more excited for some of 84 so that's right, ladies and gentlemen, for all our horror fans out there listening to the show, check out the trailer. We posted it to our Facebook page, facebook.com slash Epic Film Guys. Check out that trailer there for the film and uh, let us know what you think of it. Tell us if you're excited about it. But we're moving right along on the Epic Film Guys podcast. And, you know, I got to say, I'm about to get nuts. Now you want to get nuts? Come on, let's get nuts. I'm getting 
nuts. And I'm going to give something away here on the Epic Ooh, Film Guys baby. podcast. You know I'm going to give another digital code away. And piggybacking right off another 80s nostalgia movie with Summer of 84, I'm going to give the creme de la creme a digital code for the 4K version of it. That's right, the brand new adaptation of Stephen King's amazing classic story with Pennywise the Dancing Clown. You want a balloon, Georgie? Pop, pop, pop. Mm-hmm. That's right. All you have to do, if you're not a member of our official fan group, The Hopesters Dumpster, head on over to our Facebook page, facebook.com slash epicfilmguys, and ask to join The Hopesters Dumpster. And you're going to have to answer this question I'm about to ask you. Name two actors that were in the running to play Pennywise the Dancing Clown prior to Bill Skarsgård getting the role and performing his iconic performance as Pennywise. Just two actors. Name two actors that were rumored to be in the running to play Pennywise the Dancing Clown for Andy Muschietti's It before Bill Skarsgård got the role. Be the first person to answer in the Hopesters Dumpster, our official fan group on Facebook, and you will win the digital code for the 4K version of It. And actually, the digital code has Dolby Atmos on that shit, so you better get in there real quick if you have a nice surround sound system. Be the first one to answer. You're getting that digital code, and you'll be a winner. And I have to throw a huge shout-out to last week's winner, our good friend of the show from Netflix and Swill, Dan Director Brennick. He was the one Fuck to be off, the first Justin. one to answer. No, you won something, though, Dan. You won. <laughs> you won the digital code for the 4K Interstellar. Ooh, so major props on that. And I'm going to be announcing the winners every single week. So props on that. We're going to be giving away digital codes every week on the Epic Film Guys podcast because we love you. But, Nick, did anyone, did anyone have anything to do with the, uh, the other giveaway that you had last week on the show we did even though i awesome. had some issues with the google forms i saw that unfortunately <laughs> it, what, it, it doesn't aggregate like actually who responds to it it just takes the responses themselves so i had to delete out all the responses for whomever actually submitted responses uh so we got a few responses but i'm just going to go ahead and announce today that both paul Sturmer and leo from the afterburn 739 podcast both of them I'm giving it away twice, Justin. I don't even care. I'm giving it away to two people because I'm feeling That's generous. That's so great. You're I don't so care. giving. For You're such a month, giving guy. For one month, we're going to give away EFG Patreon status. So before this episode goes live, like once I get the patron version of it done, I'm going to go ahead and announce over in the Hopester Zumster that they won and get them an RSS that they can use to access the show while that is active. So yeah, congratulations to them. We're going to be giving away more patron status a little bit further down the road. So if you want to hear what all this hoopla is about, we do these massive extended cuts. We've got like some episodes are like 10, 15, 20 minutes of extra content, but then we've had a couple like the last Jedi review we did with Paul and Wayne is almost an hour longer. Almost an hour of extra content just with those well, we guys on the show. we can't stop Wayne from talking, though. Yep. Wayne likes to talk. Well, Wayne's he a can't talker. stop you from yeah, talking yeah. either, but we try. <laughs> <laughs> but it's it's amazing. And, you know, we want to show you guys uh, just the value of being an Epic Film Guys patron. This main show, the show will always be free. But if you want to throw us a buck a month, just help us pay for the cost of things like the live stream for the cure 2.0 which is going to be coming in the month of may for potter love which is going to be coming in august and for equipment upgrades whatever else hey a buck a month you get access to all of our exclusive content and all you got to do is go ahead and throw it right over there speaking of throwing us things justin we need a hundred itunes reviews justin and you know what's happening loy sauce when we get to a hundred itunes reviews what's that we are giving away literally the biggest EFG swag bag ever. We're giving away 4K digital codes to the entire Dark Knight trilogy. We're giving away shirts, pint glasses, probably a poster or two, a bunch of stickers. Sauce. We're even giving we're away. giving away Loy Sauce. I don't think he knew your this body. before he was on the show. Your body. We, That's right. You're going to be a manslave to somebody for whatever purpose they want to utilize you for. For what, what do you think? Six months, Justin? Six I was thinking more like eight months to a year, eight but I think to, okay. six months will suffice. Well, we'll, as we'll long start as he with has six the months, time. and then if Loisos really likes him, he can go up as as much as nine months to a year. It's up to Loisos to add to the contract, I guess, in the end. 
I, I don't think he knew that before he's on the show, and now he's being awfully quiet. <laughs> hey, I have I have a problem hey. with hey what? you you oh, assholes. God. Hey, I hear you talking about giving things away. I've been a part of this whole deal for a long time. I ain't getting nothing free. What am I dead. getting something out of this? <laughs> that, you, you are you smoking that crack that I offered you last week or what? What do you got over there? Uh, I got that from a guy by head that divides. He said that was the fire shit. That's how he put it. I don't really know if it's good, but you smoking it now. <laughs> hey, Loy Sauce, when you gonna take me over to McDonald's to get me some free double cheese? Oh. I will take you to McDonald's if you're if you're really good and you and you stay away from that booze and you brush your teeth at least once in your godforsaken life. So you'll teeth? never take him then is is basically no. what you're saying. I really like that flannel shirt you was wearing there last time I saw you. I was hoping you'd give it to me to use as a blanket, but instead I froze my fucking ass off, you fucking pile of shit. Thanks a lot. You're not really that kind to a homeless gentleman like myself, are you? <laughs> I gave you I gave you a whole quarter. <laughs> How much is that going to buy? I live where a bunch of rich people go. I hang out and live near the rich person's McDonald's where they're willing to pay $3 for a double cheese. Ain't no one there spending no dollar because they're on their cell phone talking to someone in some hummus somewhere else. They don't give a shit. Well, a, a quarter will get you uh, one-fourth of a McChicken. McChicken? Who eats that garbage? I want a McDouble. I want double fucking cheese. And in fact, I want you to come over to Ned Divine's right now. I know you don't live very far. I heard Justin say you live in the McAllister house. I know you're about 10 miles away. Come over right now and buy me a couple shots of Mr. Boston. They have it there. Maybe Jameson. Maybe Bacardi. Who fucking knows what they have? I just want you to get me drunk right now. I mean, I think I may be already halfway you're, there. Yeah, but you already I w you know where it is. Come meet me right now to that McDonald's, and I want to get drunk. All right. Well, I I am I am craving a McFlurry, so I I might just I might just come over. I don't even know what's going on here, dude. He just literally pounded through the door. I was in the middle of trying to keep the, the 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 microphone on mute, and I didn't want Danielle to wake up, and the dogs were barking, and. Dude, he literally pounded in the door almost where like there's like a big dent in the middle of it. And then I let him in. He fell on the kitchen floor for like two minutes straight <laughs> as I had it on mute when you guys were talking. And I then of course heard, he like, got a loud up and, thud or something. Yeah, no, dude, for real. Uh, I, I think he's gone, though. I think he went off to the neighbors knocking on their door. I don't even know what's going on. What a story, Other than Mark. the fact that, yeah, of course. And, you know, uh, he's mentioned this to me before that. Uh, he wants to be girly good friends with Tommy Wiseau, so maybe we should get those two together. I don't know. Maybe there's a movie in there somewhere. Maybe we can like produce it or something. Just keep him away from You're me, not guys. My I'm, I'm, I'm super sorry about that. I'm super sorry about that. I thought he was gone for good, but apparently he wants to keep making his way back into the show. He takes over Twitter accounts. Just, 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 just don't mention money or booze or, or anything that's going to benefit him in any way. That's maybe all we'll we ever talk about on from. the show is money and booze, though. <laughs> So all no we ever ways, fucking no talk gifts. about, man. Oh. You don't want a gift of the hopester with you for a full year as your 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 patron gift. So no, you don't want that. That's as what a prize. we should give away one one full year of just nothing but double cheese and Mister Boston. Sometimes double cheese is dunked in Mister Boston. I Ugh. think that you, the, the whole fact that he knows that Loisos goes to that McDonald's now, Loisos is trying to keep it a secret. Don't lie, Brian. You want to hold it a secret that you at McDonald's. Like, he's seen you there many times, and uh, he he just wants to. He's seen him there because he was in you. the car with him when he went there. I know. Don't God lie. After, after you hang Loisos. out with me, you're going Please to pick him up, and you're me. hanging Please. out with him. I think Loisos is like, what happened? <laughs> Boy sauce just he, I lost I lost the plot. I lost the the conversation. Sorry. It's okay. I mean the gone. homester was in here. There wasn't really a conversation. It was just more, you know, drunken shouting and stuff. It boils down to this. I sucked a dick last night. There it is. Yeah. <laughs> it, it may it may even have been the hopesters. His disease infected thing. It's got like bumps Ew. and boils and 
It's got ooze coming out of the tip of it and everything. We don't want to talk about all that. We don't want to scare off our new possible listeners. Uh, we love you guys. And, you know, you made us this take far. The now you're right like, now. they're talking about dicks and shit. Oh. I said, we talk about yeah. dicks a lot on this show. I don't know who keeps putting these damn buttons on here so people can talk about sucking dicks, but I, I mean, sucked a dick last night. Thank you, Wayne. Thank you, Wayne, from the Countdown Movie and TV Reviews podcast for chiming in there with your beautiful voice. Hey, there. try not to great, suck any dick on the way to singer. the parking lot. Even the, even the clips I added today from movies are still dick related. Oh man! I uh, just we're a podcast that thinks a lot about. Dicks, I think this I is guess. just going to become mean, the blowjob board. I'm just going to start going through here, just replacing all the sound drops with nothing but mentions of oral sex. That's that's just so horrible. We're you just sucked so, his dick. So horrible. <laughs> My girlfriend sucked thirty-seven dicks in a row. <laughs> oh, we are my God at the end of the show. We, we just want to take the time though. over. Oh. God, I've had I'm a still, great time today. This though. Manhattan man. Let, let me let me tell our audience. You'll remember. And now, You're granted, still on this thing. Oh my god! In terms of recording time, it was, you know, longer ago than it's going to seem in the final cut of the show. But I am still desperately trying to finish this Manhattan thing. It has gotten worse with every subsequent sip. The further I get down the glass, I've got maybe I don't know, probably only like four ounces or so left. But Jesus, it's hard. It's just. I don't know, like, I think the warmer it got, like, the 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 more that cherry and that coriander kind of come out to play, and they really eh, turn the whole thing a little bit. It's just, <clears throat> give me Monstrosis any day over this shit. That Monstrosis was awesome. This started off well and just took a giant shit. So, yeah, that's it for me. Uh, for Justin, for myself, for the god of podcasting himself, for the one the only Loichos or Loithoth or Loichos. whatever you yeah, want to call From now on, Loichos, who I'm going to put on my stake every time I have one. We are so, so good. thankful that he joined us for the show tonight. So thank you very, very much. Loichos. Thank you, guys. There he is. It's always a pleasure. Who, thank uh, you. We uh, talked in the middle of recording there, and he's going to be joining us for Black Panther, which is one of his most anticipated He's going to be reviewing it with you alone, because I'm not fucking watching it. No, nope, you're seeing it. You're seeing it. We're going <laughs> to... Isn't that right, Lois House? We're going to put up a poll on the page and make Nick see it. Cheep, 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 cheep. Tell Nick why he needs to see Black Panther. Um, Because it's a Marvel movie, <laughs> and we all love those, right? <laughs> he needs to watch it. He's going to watch it, but... Thank you guys so much for <laughs> listening to the show. Thanks, Loisos, for coming on here tonight. And you know what? Loisos, I'm super excited for you to pick me up after work tomorrow to go to that black tie event for Phantom Thread at Alamo Draft House. It's a very special event. I'm very excited. I'm going to dress up for it and uh, I get some free booze, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I get to watch Daniel Day Lewis's supposed last performance ever. I don't have a sound drop for that. I'm sorry. <laughs> and um, drop, drop the, drop the Lincoln. Shall we stop this bleeding? Oh my Yo, god, man, that's I need great. to watch that, that movie. That, I love that movie. That needs to be added to the soundboard. Speaking, oh my speaking god, speaking of Schulberg, he was in that too. He was great in that as well. But yeah, I'm super excited for tomorrow. Also tomorrow, Blade Runner 2049 comes out on 4K Ultra HD Blu-ray, which of course means for you guys out there listening a digital code will be released next week i'm hearing great things i'm hearing it's reference quality for the medium and i'll be handing it away to you because i love you and i love you guys for listening if you're new if you're old if you continue to listen we love you no matter what we hope you continue listening to the epic film guys podcast every single week and join us join us on twitter instagram at epic film guys on facebook at epic film guys be a part of our world. Be a part of what we love so much. And don't chew like loy sauce because it's obnoxious and it made <laughs> make me want to punch you in the mouth. I don't know. I haven't heard that popcorn in a while. I'm guessing he finished it. I finished it. Yeah. I've seen him hold like a huge giant tub of popcorn at the theater 
And in the beginning of the movie, it's full. By the end of it, I look and I've had only two handfuls that he shares with me, and the whole rest of it's fucking gone. So yeah, That's he'll eat the whole. That's not true. It totally is true. You and your five thousand calorie fucking milkshake too. You'll drink that down like there's no tomorrow. <laughs> so don't give me that. But thank you guys so much for listening. For myself, for Nick, for Loy Sauce. <laughs> Get me some fucking McDonald's, you motherfuckers. And we'll see you at the movies. I love that the crickets just kept playing right through the end there. Just, nope. That's what you get. We'll redo that. My girlfriend sucked For- 37 dicks. In a row? <laughs> That's so horrible. Um, Blaise, why don't you, why don't you uh, lead us off? For myself. For Nick. For Justin. Thank you for listening, and we will see you at the movie. The dumpster. <laughs> that's perfect. And that's a wrap. Shut up, Dan. Network.com.